Hi everyone, uh, we'll just let everyone come on. We've got people quickly coming on now. We're up to sort of 25, but in the first one second, so it's rapidly going up. I'll just let everyone, um, I'll give everyone about one minute, just or 30 seconds, just to, to join us. But welcome to our eighth session for our biocontrol workshops. And I'll give people 10 more seconds. If you want to take the time, um, what we'd really encourage is if you could introduce yourself in the chat box there, please say who you are, where you're from, um, and uh, share, share something interesting if, if you've got the inclination. And I've also just put the agenda up there for you uh, as well, so you can see what you what we have in store for you today. Just remember, the main way we're going to interact today is through the Q and A box. So if you've got questions, please put them in that Q and A box, and uh, we will ask the speakers uh, from from there. Please. Please use the chat if you want to share any information. So I'm going to start the session. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, session eight. Uh, time flies because uh, this has been a six month series uh, and this is one of our final workshops of the session. It is around the important role of biocontrol and integrated pest management. Now we've got a very busy agenda ahead of us. Uh, we have three speakers, three experts, and we're going to have uh, examples drawn from the Philippines, from Brazil, and from Cambodia. So we're really lucky to see that. Uh, and there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers uh, as well. Just remember the main way we do uh, participate in this session and the way we interact is through the Q&A box. Um, so please try and ask your questions in, in, that, in that box there. That's really important because it helps us to uh, run an efficient session. But we really want to hear from you as well uh, through the chat. Uh, so if you want to share your work, your research, um, thank a speaker, please uh, put that in the chat and make sure you introduce yourself to everyone as well. Now, just a reminder that the ASEAN Action Plan and Fall Armyworm Biocontrol Technical Workshop Series is a six month series. We're almost at the end. It's been uh, supported by Grow Asia, CABI, IPM Innovation Lab, and many other uh, organizations and institutes uh, and uh, the private sector uh, from, around, uh, from around the world. Um, we are very uh, delighted and feel very privileged to have all those experts who are talking today, but have also other experts who have spoken in previous workshops. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a little bit sad to get to the end, but it's also um, been quite an achievement. If you would like to give us feedback and questions, we would really like to hear what you're working on on biocontrol and even what you thought of the biocontrol workshop series. And you can do that by going to ASEAN, FAWaction.org. Uh, also, if you want a certificate of participation, you must subscribe to that forum and either ask a question, share something interesting about biocontrol, or note something you found useful in this series. And just to tell you how you can do that, you go to the website, you then click on community, click on forum, and then you can um, comment in one of the forums um, called Biocontrol for Fall Armyworm. And we already have quite a lot of interaction happening there. Now, as I said, this is the eighth session. We're almost at the end. We will have one more integrative workshop where we pull together a lot of the strands uh, and that will be held uh, around August. Uh, we are still to finalize the details for that, but as soon as we do, we will email those to all the registrants uh, that have participated in this series. Now I'm going to launch a poll. It's not a scientifically rigorous poll. It's just to get us warmed up and uh, I've got some kind of uh, different questions there and some more serious questions. The first question is, what is your favorite insect from the following list? And I'm kind of keen to see what you choose. Two is, what stakeholder group best describes the organization you work for? 
And three is how many ASEAN Full Army Women Action Biocontrol workshops have you participated in? So I'm keen to see who's joining us today. So I can see just uh, for your information, your favorite insect. Oh, it's a bit of a competition here between the ladybird and the full army worm. <laughs> so if you are liking any of those other insects, get in there fast because uh, they are behind by quite a way. You can see it's a hot competition there. Stakeholder group best describes the organization you work for. We have got, hmm, quite a lot from research university, private sector and international organizations. And I will give you the results soon of how many ASEAN Full Army Worm Action Workshops people participated in. I'm going to give people another 30 seconds to participate. And I'm kind of keen to see who, what, which is the favorite uh, insect here. And Pranav, do you want to launch the um, end the polling and launch the results? Okay, I hope everyone can see those results. Ladybird was a bit of a clear winner there. Um, stink bug wasn't very popular, so uh, that's a little bit unfortunate for them. And I'm surprised there's a lot of people that really have a favourite full army worm preference. It's nice to see, embrace our enemy. Uh, number two, what stakeholder group best describes the organization you work for? Actually, that's really kind of interesting. We've got a lot of government people. Thank you for joining us. Research university organizations, good, good private sector, but also quite high level of international organizations and welcome to the, the students in the room as well. And this is quite exciting because 39% of you have actually participated in five plus of these workshops. So, and another 35, sorry, percent have three or four. So that's amazing. A lot of you have followed us th through the whole, through the whole series. So thank you for participating uh, in this. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy our very last one today, which I'm sure you will. So I'm going to stop that poll and I'm going to move to the next screen and this is my chance to introduce our first speaker Mario Navasero. He is a uh, scientist with the National Crop Protection Centre uh, at the University of Philippines Los Banos. He has many many years of experience in IPM and he has a very active research team around him uh, that I am in contact with as well uh, and who are also working on full armyworms. So I'm really excited to, to um, introduce you to Mario and uh, welcome Mario, are you on the line and can you hear yes, us? Yes, yes. Before good afternoon. we before, good afternoon. Before we start, what was your favorite insect out of that list? Did you did you have one there? Uh silence. I'm working on silence. Oh, okay. Right, great. Okay, so I'm going to let you uh I'm going to stop my share. Could you load your presentation up? Okay. Okay, good afternoon. <laughs> can I start now? You can, please, you're okay. welcome. Well, I'll be sharing my uh, some of our experiences in the uh, biological control research here in the Philippines and try to relate it with our present problem on PAU. So what will be some of these uh, experiences that we can actually uh, use in terms of PAU management? So uh, uh, Ms. Allison gave us uh, a guide questions to answer uh, for our presentation. So I'll try to answer them one by one through the following slides. So uh, why? what is the role of biocon? Let me first uh, start with the current problem that we have now in the Philippines. Uh, I think Paul Armyworm with the latest data uh, given by the Bureau of Plant Industry. We have around 25% infestation of our corn growing areas. And the problem now is that uh, um, the previous insecticides being used for poor armyworm 
especially those used for wall application and uh, basal application. We have fibronil and carbofuran. Uh, we have found them to be not working anymore. Uh, even from the start when coal and uh, arrived, uh, farmers are already complaining that these chemicals are not, uh, uh, are not effective anymore. And uh, initial, uh, uh, initial talk with farmers, uh, for sweet corn, because sweet corn is considered a high value crops, the regular spraying is every three days, but uh, when uh, fall armor came, spraying uh, increases uh, three times a day, from three, three days interval to three times a day interval. So they usually practice cocktailing uh, using different insecticides, but if you will look at the uh, initial list, most of them are actually belonging to uh, the old uh, groups of insecticides, which I have, uh, which we have documented in the case of uh, onion armor to be not working anymore, like pyrethroids, carbamates, and organic phosphates. Uh, to start with, uh, actually, um, usually the first line of defense in when we, uh, when we have this outbreak uh, is to find out the most, the more effective uh, insecticides. And actually have done that, we were able to uh, find out which of these uh, chemicals are effective because uh, the government, our fertilizer and fertilizer authority came up with the, uh, what we call this uh, list of insecticides, it's special use permit. And we found out not all of those given special use permit were effective. So we have here, identi we have identified uh, the effective ones. However, uh, we have, serious concerns regarding this, although we can say we can effectively control uh, all armor with this uh, insecticides, but you know, uh, it has been our experience, uh, even uh, for example, uh, with our probably with diamond back moth and egg protein protein water, in 2007, 2008, they came up with the very effective insecticides belonging to the uh, diamide group. In two to three years, we have already documented full, uh, full grown resistance. So in this case, uh, in some areas where the government provided insecticides and in, in usually uh, government agencies provide only one or two brands of insecticides. And in some areas that we have uh, uh, observed or went to, uh, some farmers have already observed declining efficacy of this insecticide. So this is very alarming because among those insecticides that we found uh, effective for uh, active ingredients belong to one group, to one mode of action. And that, and all of these are uh, actually, when, when uh, we know for a fact that uh, uh, resistance, there will be cross resistance between the uh, different uh, active ingredients belonging to the same mode of action. And another concern is that uh, we have already documented or even uh, the uh, seed companies uh, are telling us that some of their uh, single tri protein events uh, of GM corn are already uh, uh, susceptible to power. So some companies are already withdrawing this uh, single event uh, product. So let me just uh, start sharing with you our experiences uh, in handling some of this outbreak uh, using biocontrol agents. For example, this outbreak of catwalk in uh, Pangasinan in 2003, if you will notice, we uh, have around four uh, full-grown uh, full uh, catworm in one plant, right plant. And uh, fortunately, during that, out ah, during that outbreak, uh, farmers are already complaining they cannot control the catworm with the insects they were using. But fortunately, uh, when we went in the area, we already noticed that a few individuals of catworm who already been infected with NPV. So what we did is uh, uh, ask these farmers to, con uh, to collect those infected with NPVs and spray it again on their uh, field. So one week after those, uh, when after spraying those uh, NPVs, uh, they already saw uh, cutworm 
on top of leaves, uh, all are infected. So from this uh, simple field uh, demo, we, we try to exploit what is existing in the area. So in this, in this simple field demo, uh, the, farmer, the farmers were uh, easily convinced with regards to the effectiveness of uh, NPV for cutworm. So we asked them to collect uh, dead cadavers of cutworm, store them in uh, 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 mineral water uh, plastic containers, and they can put it in the ref or uh, bury it in the irrigation canals, uh, at least to provide a stable temperature. So, and from these uh, collections, it is uh, the same preparation that they use to control or to spray other fields infected with carbon in the area. So, because of that uh, experience, the farmers uh, ask us if they can, we can train them to. Uh, produce their own NPV. So we came up with the village level training on mass production of NPVs. And this actually became a popular one in, uh, uh, in the area. As a matter of fact, uh, it was picked up by one of the company, Northern Food Corporation, who is engaged into, pro into processing tomato. So they invited us to uh, also teach their technicians and farmers to how to produce these NPVs. Uh, not only cutworm NPV, but also the helicoverpa NPV. So we tried to also put demos in their areas, comparing with their uh, crop protection practices uh, using purely NPV and those uh, in their practice using uh, different silos. So they were convinced regarding also the effectiveness of NPV. So another uh, outbreak that we were able to uh, encounter during uh, here in the Philippines, it was in 2005 to 2007, the outbreak of uh, the coconut leaf beetle on this uh, In other countries, it took about uh, four or five years before the outbreak uh, was put in control. But here in the Philippines, it took only about uh, two years because during the, even in, during the, early stage of uh, the outbreak, we were already documenting several natural enemies. And as a matter of fact, in uh, about less than a year from the report, we were already uh, uh, observing some uh, trees recovering from the attack of uh, brood pispa. In this particular uh, case, uh, if you will notice, we have here Kelisokes morio. Uh, this is uh, the very first natural enemy that we concentrated on. Uh, we tried to develop a mass rearing technique using uh, indigenous materials, coconut fire dust, uh, reusable plastic uh, containers of uh, soft drinks, uh, fabricated cages using plastic, and uh, use, uh, we use uh, what we call this, uh, fingerlings, prime meals, uh, because uh, in mass rearing of earwig, they are using dog food, which is very expensive. And you still have to ground it while the fingerlings, uh, these fingerlings prime meals, uh, they're already uh, uh, powderized. So we also introduced village level mass production and uh, some farmers use this in one area, their field here. And they were also convinced to be to the use of uh, Irving for the control of Rontispa. And this is also used for the control of uh, pests of uh, bananas. Uh, the most recent probably is, you have heard the news of uh, outbreak of coconut scale insect in the Philippines. Actually, there were three uh, major areas uh, that outbreak uh, happened. In Luzon, it took about four or five years before the uh, infestations of side and in one uh, island province, Pasilans, it took about six to seven years. Uh, but in Sambuanga Peninsula, where we uh, immediately introduced the parasitoid that we encountered in Luzon, it took only two years. Uh, after two years, uh, the problem was already under control. In Sambuanga, it took about seven years because they came up with about seven rounds or four rounds, three to four rounds of trunk injection. In Luzon, uh, uh, they attribute it to uh, 
uh, the typhoon that came in during that time. But actually, we've been saying that uh, this parasite is already in control in the zone during that time. So let me share with you a very specific uh, experience. Uh, this is in corn. Uh, in 2000, uh, BT corn was introduced in the Philippines, but we have also done BT corn uh, being planted by our farmers. So what uh, alternative can we provide uh, to these farmers, even for those who are, uh, because at that time, many are still against the introduction of GM corn. So we uh, thought of uh, exploiting the use of NPVs, and also we have already, must, uh, we're already successful in uh, uh, mass producing or stantilus, a uh, predatory bug, which is very effective for uh, corn borer. At that time, uh, that was December, when we about when we are about to start our project. And uh, the GM corn are already existing in the field. And we found out that uh, in GM corn fields, the population of Oreos are already high. Uh, remember that the one advantage of GM corn that uh, they are claiming is that it actually encourages the buildup of uh, natural enemies. And true enough, in that area, we were able to find out that uh, the uh, natural population of Oreos, the predator, is already high. So the farmers actually challenged us uh, because during that time, they say they cannot produce uh, green corn, December, January, February, because uh, it is always being attacked by corn burn. So, but what happened really is, uh, uh, we told them that we will not, they will not have any more problems with corn borer because uh, uh, our uh, hypothesis then is that the natural enemies from BT corn will only transfer to those uh, non BT corn once they start uh, planting it. So, and that's exactly what happened in our experiment. So during, uh, this is our uh, experimental plants. And when we took samples of the tassel, we found about 10 to 25 uh, individuals of Oreos. So this uh, particular experiment, which is supposed to be tested for uh, uh, helicoberpa uh, NPVs, where they affected them on left to right. So without even any intervention, uh, this particular uh, corn field uh, was able to uh, was able to uh, harvest with, even without using any uh, control measure. So one uh, way, uh, what if we don't have Oreos in the field? So there is another uh, simple uh, technique that we uh, were able to develop. We use uh, Uray garden. Uray, Uray is actually, uh, as, uh, what do you call this? Uh, let me, it's a weed. Amaranthus, it's Amaranthus spinosus. Uh, remember that in natural uh, condition, you won't be able to produce so much Oreos in Amaranthus spinosus if, if this uh, predator will depend only in terms of uh, the natural uh, occurrence of their prey. So we were able to develop another technique of fast producing flower mite. Uh, with the flower mite, we put them in the fluorescence of uh, Amaranthus. So this serves as a uh, food for the Oreos. So in, in that technique, we were able to produce around 100 Oreos per plant with this technique. So another technique that we uh, are recommending is to advance the planting of uh, Amaranthus spinosus on the borders of uh, uh, the field so they can uh, enhance or encourage the uh, initial uh, establishment of Oreos. So recently, uh, another, uh, probably another technique that we uh, can use for the control of all army war is uh, the use of botanicas. And lately we have already done also some uh, field trials and we found out uh, about three, three or four botanicas that are also working for PAU. So, uh, and this one is very, uh, matrin is very uh, exceptional in terms of its effectiveness for poor army war. The, the neem oil is not that effective anymore for PAU. So um, the question now of how uh, we can overcome the apprehension of farmers in using some of these uh, uh, 
biological control agents or by control technologies. In the examples that we uh, shared to you, uh, we are actually emphasizing here the participatory approach that we did and the actual demonstration and to, to uh, show that the biocontrol agent can really control their pest. Then we also uh, tried to develop the village level production technique uh, for this different biocontrol agent. And of course, exploiting the existing natural enemies in the area. So with regards to uh, possible research that should be that uh, fortunately here in the Philippines, the government is funding a lot of researches, uh, especially those uh, on biocontrol. So those, these are in various level of uh, development. And in one of those uh, research has already been uh, producing uh, metarisium. And according to the uh, researchers, they're already giving out these to farmers in one region. So we have here several uh, uh, researches. So what is the gap now that we are considering here in the Philippines in, in terms of the control of armyworm? Uh, we have several species of armyworms. We have uh, the two armyworms within a separata. We have another one. Uh, this is, uh, I'm sorry. Within the separata and the black armyworm. We have uh, occasional outbreak of this, but the outbreak doesn't last long because we have a uh, very good uh, diverse natural enemies here in the Philippines. So the challenge now is at this stage, even uh, one year after the introduction of PAO, incursion of PAO here in the Philippines, we will we start already uh, documenting several natural enemies. So the challenge to us is how to make these uh, native natural enemies uh, 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 that are now having new associations with PAO, how can we uh, enhance their uh, performance, just like the natives uh, in the native species of all army worm. So the challenge for us is uh, how can we enhance these natural enemies uh, so that uh, ultimately, because uh, to be able to, uh, to manage PAO, ultimately we have to make these natural enemies work. And uh, I think in many cases of outbreak here in the Philippines, even introduced species, in three to four years, uh, there is a natural decline in population of this uh, outbreak species. So we are also expecting this in Paul Arion, as long as uh, we will be limiting uh, control practices that may uh, encourage the development of this uh, existing natural enemies now here in the Philippines. So uh, that's all, I think. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mario. Um, brilliant um, examples. And it's really good to see, I, I think, some of those lessons that you learned. Um, really interesting how you worked with farmers and uh, to actually also have farmers really interested in part of the process. I think that's got some good uh, lessons for us all. We have lots of questions for you, so I hope you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank Probably you. won't be able to answer all of them, but um, here's a question for around, I think it was back to the start of your presentation around the resistance and the use of pesticides. Are fipronil and carbofuran not effective because the fall armyworm has grown resistance to it? Or are these just not the right ones to use to fight fall armyworm? Well, uh, remember that the apple armyworm is an introduced species here in the in, in Philippines, and even in many parts of the uh, world. And I think some of this uh, uh, pole armyworm that uh, uh, came from the Americas may be carrying with them already this resistance uh, to this, some of these insecticides because when you review the literature, there are already many reports of resistance even in the Americas. Uh, for several insecticides. So uh, we suspect that uh, maybe this, uh, in, in this, uh, the population introduced into these uh, new areas have already their uh, resistance already. 
coming from the origin. That's very interesting. And we had a bit of discussion on that two weeks ago in our resistance management workshop. And you mentioned it today around these uh, sort of single trait BT corn. Yeah. Um, do you think, is it time to sort of make sure that they're withdrawn maybe from use uh, to sort of avoid resistance? Because there is, res there is cases of that in Brazil, isn't there resistance building or has, has been found against in, in these uh, single traits uh, BT maize varieties? Um, come again. Uh, no, again. I guess what I'm asking is you, you talked about the, the single trait BT corn and, and the potential resistance uh, for yes. lummy worm. And, and you said that there's still some of that in use in the Philippines. Do you think it's time or do you think there's some pressure to withdraw that then from, from use? Actually, uh, uh, some of our stuff that went in those areas. Uh, uh, receive information even from the technical uh, people from companies that they are actually withdrawing some of these products. Okay. And they are now going into uh, pyramid. Uh, okay. Excellent. Now here's a question here. Nowadays farmers give attention and interest for biological control methods, but how can we make them take up biological control methods with no fear? encourage them more. I think you gave some tips today about including them in the process, but how do you really encourage farmers more? Are they really interested in trying out biological control solutions? Well, uh, if the air could be some of the effectiveness of the fire control products, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the projects that I have been, uh, listed in the list of projects that I presented uh, actually are claiming that farmers are clamoring for some of the biological control agents already. So the the, the uh, demand, I mean, uh, the, what we call this, uh, they're already aware, and especially when uh, uh, comparing this to the use of insecticides, which of course is very expensive, and the government is planning to sell these biocontrol agents uh, at a very low price. So uh, I think uh, it will not be very hard. Uh, to really convince some farmers to use this by Okay, that's good to hear. Here's a question here. Um, there was quite a bit of interest in this. Um, what species of Oreos are, are you referring to? Uh, we have here Oreos stantibus. Okay, there we go. There's an answer for that. Um, now, here's a quite a specific question. I'm not sure if, if you'll be able to answer this, but what dosage of potassium salt of fatty acids was found effective? Uh, okay, I, I, I was not able to emphasize that. Uh, potassium salt uh, fatty acid is effective in terms of when we talk about damage and number of larvae. But uh, I forgot to emphasize in that slide that potassium salt of fatty acids is phytotoxic. Uh, when you look into the uh, plant height, it's uh, the only treatment in our experiment that are uh, what we call very short because the internodes turn to be uh, what we call this. Uh, the, the, the internodes are very short, so the plants appear stocky, and uh, even the yield in yield when it comes to yield, they produce small uh, ears. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's a here's sort of a more technical question, um, but I'm sure you can help out. Is is it good to use the Davis scale, which is actually for plant damage, for understanding for pesticide efficacy, to categorize products into efficacious and non-efficacious? Yes, because uh, I think uh, Davis scale is now the standard uh, method being used, not only here. I think all over the world. And uh, we, we, we can actually relate this also on terms of count of larvae. And although we haven't done that, but in, in terms of our uh, graph or data, we both present Davis uh, rating and also count of larvae. And uh, there is no, uh, there is also uh, what we call the same results when we look into the, what are the effectives and what are not effectives. Yeah, exactly. 
Okay, great. Here's a question. Did anyone try releasing trichogramma effinescence to parasite the eggs of fall army worm? I think during the initial uh, incarceration of fall army worm, they tried it in one region of the Philippines uh, where, the, where, where we first uh, encountered fall army worm in region two. But it seems uh, uh, it didn't work uh, for fall okay. army worm. Oh, well, that's interesting. Um, he, here's a technical question here. Well, it's, it, I think it's a, a useful question. Um, uh, what is a wool application or a wool application? A uh, wool application is actually your, uh, usually this is uh, used for products that are gran formulated as granules or powder. Uh, you, you put them uh, right there in the uh, wall of the corn. Excellent. The drawing Thank point. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, it's good we have a range of people here today. So you can see we've got a we've got sort of more basic sort of technical questions through to very uh, uh, detailed technical questions, and you'll see those soon on the um, Q and A board. Thank you so much, um, Mario. That was a very good presentation. I love the examples, and there's lots of lessons there to take on board. I'm also um, really uh, excited to see how much research is being doing that has been is being done, uh, and and uh, what you're doing now. And we're looking forward to seeing some of the results. I think uh, of your laboratory and research team. Um, if you could take the time just to jump on the question and answer board, there's actually 19 open questions there for you that we won't have time to ask now. Um, if you could answer some of those, that, type the answer. That would be most appreciated. Okay. Thank you so okay, much. Okay. Thank you thank so you, much, thank Mario. You. Thank, you. thank you. And I'd now like to introduce our second speaker today, uh, Dr. Ajanor Mafra Nito, and he is a chemical ecology researcher and entrepreneur in the entomological field of insect chemical ecology. He's the CEO of ISCA Technologies, a company specializing in the development of semiochemical solutions for pest management, robotic smart traps and nano sensors, which sounds pretty exciting. So I'm excited to uh, see your presentation, which I know is going to sort of take us uh, in different directions and looking at big scale and small scale uh, farming, maize farming and fall army worm. So welcome to our workshop and uh, please start. Thank you, Alison. Uh, really a pleasure to be here today. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, uh, what is the role of biological control on IPM? Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our experience in Brazil and a little bit also in India. So um, we have been working with fall armor worm for quite some time and uh, there are six major components to an IPM program uh, that needs to be done everywhere we, we go. First is that to have a good uh, identification of the pest. The other one is to be able to monitor and assess pest uh, numbers and damage, but also the natural enemies that you have in the field. The third one is the to have guidelines of when to the management action is needed. So um, you can use preventative pests, uh, you can prevent pest problems like uh, avoid economic damage. And um, you should be using a combination of tools with different modes of actions like biopesticides, biological control, cultural, physical, uh, mechanical, and chemical management tools. And once you do, you take the action, you assess the effect of pest management. So it's really important in a program, an IPM program, any IPM program, to monitor either by scouting or using pheromone traps or any other form of, uh, of monitoring. Uh, and pheromones and semi-chemicals can help in the pheromone trap side of things. The, um, so biocontrol and biopesticides. Biocontrol is the method of controlling pests using other organisms. It's rely, it relies in predation, parasitism, and other natural mechanisms. Biopesticides are pesticides derived from natural materials such as animals, plant, bacteria, and other minerals. And um, so there are three categories of uh, biochemical pesticides. Um, you know, uh, bi biochemical pesticides, for example, 
pheromones and um, you know canola oil, baking soda, etc. Uh, microbial pest biopesticides and uh, plant incorporated uh, protectants like uh, GM crops uh, that contain Bt uh, genes and express the Bt genes. So conventional control. Conventional control works by the grower taking the insecticides and chasing the pests with that insecticide. So it's really important that you have extremely good coverage on the, um, in the field, that the, you cover every single part of the plant that you are uh, trying to protect. The biggest problem with that is that it kills everything. It kills all the natural enemies, kills uh, sometimes uh, the pests. But one of the biggest problems is that we have been losing a lot of modes of action because uh, insectic uh, insecticides uh, drive the evolution of resistance. What, uh, and the evolution of the resistance is very simple. You have some, uh, some individuals in the population that are resistant. If you spray the same mode of action over and over and over, you and then end up uh, selecting for the resistant pest in the, the field and you end up with a pest that is uh, resilient to uh, the application of that type of insecticide. The IRAC has 37 modes of action, including you know, insecticides and uh, insecticide, different types of conventional insecticides, viruses, bacteria, etc. And But what is really bothering me is that the Asian countries seem to, uh, according to a report that I saw in, um, by this group, uh, has only seven chemicals belonging to five modes of action. So this is, seems to be a very, very small number of modes of action. And so it's really, really important that we have a, either a very, very strong uh, integrated uh, resistance management or we bring more modes of action or both. So uh, we usually work with a different concept. Uh, instead of taking the uh, insecticide to the past, we bring the past to the control method. How do we do this? We usually focus on the mobile uh, part of the, uh, of the population of the species. And um, usually we address the adults. Uh, the growers, usually they are worried about the larvae. So, but the idea is that if you kill one adult, for example, a fowl army worm, you're killing about 500 to uh, 2,000 larvae, future larvae in the field. So how we do this uh, pest, uh, pest control method, what we modify the behavior of the, the bug to come to the point source, we use sex pheromones for mating disruption where males cannot find females, and we use attract and kill where we use an attractant, the, the, the insect comes and manipulates the plant, the, the, the point source and dies. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our experience in Brazil. Uh, Brazil, we have many different uh, uh, clients, but I want to, uh, to talk specifically about the very large stakeholders in Brazil. We are working with uh, <clears throat> groups that have between 400 to 600,000 hectares of uh, crop production a year. And they, these people are producing, this is basically uh, how they harvest and how they plant the not new crop. They are harvesting the old crop, planting the new crop. So you have crop all over the year in that, this region here of Brazil. For fall army warm, it's, that's a huge problem because Fall armyworm has a uh, uh, host all year round. So from January to December, there's host in the field. So you have populations that don't uh, that are always growing, and they become more and more difficult to uh, control using conventional methods, and they are becoming resistant to many modes of action, including uh, uh, genetically modified plants. But the problem of Brazil is that you don't have only Spodoptera. You have several other different pests that are being um, used, uh, that the grower is using insecticides in the field to control. So if you come with a solution, say, made in disruption for Spodoptera, 
the grower still is going to use a lot of insecticide to, to control everything else in the field. So it's very important that you control a certain group, a certain cohort of pests, otherwise your product is not going to work for the grower in the field. They are going to continue to use conventional pesticides. So what, um, when uh, we started working in Brazil in 2012, 2013, bringing new uh, uh, forms of uh, protection for growers, uh, for uh, row crop growers, and um, in during that interaction, I started working with uh, the group of Bon Futuro. Uh, they have uh, they they grow more or less six hundred thousand uh, hectares of uh, different crops, basically soy, corn, and cotton. And uh, after a couple of years, we started a center of excellence for semi-chemical control for row crops, uh, together with Bon Futuro. Uh, both uh, uh, ISCA and Bofotur invest in that uh, in this center, and that allowed us to bring products now that are being developed together with the farmer in, in, uh, in a way that inserts the product inside the, um, the crop. These large growers, they want to go green. They want IPM with biopesticides and biopesticides being uh, biological or being uh, semi-chemical. So to control fall, fall army worm in Brazil, we found out that we cannot do only mating disruption, we have to do also attract and kill. Um, we developed a formulation many years ago called SPLAT. Um, we can apply by uh, mechanically, and in Brazil we apply by airplane, tractor, drone, and um, you can also apply it by hand. SPLAT is a, a FAW, is a mating disruption for the fall army worm. We uh, apply this uh, in the field and there's uh, many, many dollops in the field compete with the females that are emitting pheromone, sex pheromone. Males cannot find the females, no mating, you end up, the population end up uh, collapsing without a single drop of insecticide. Uh, that's the major advantage of mating disruption. The problem is, is that it's extremely specific, uh, species specific. So it, uh, mating disruption for fall armyworm works only for fall armyworm. And then we have another product called Noctovi. It's an attract and kill for noctuid moss, uh, especially uh, including uh, fall armyworm. So this product, uh, you put point sources in the field, the, both males and females, especially gravid females that are very hungry, they come, manipulate the point sources in the field, and they die. And uh, usually uh, what we do is we sell the product, the grower uses 1%, adds 1% of uh, an insecticide, and that uh, affects control in the field and also lasts for significantly longer than a, an application of insecticide. We did the calculations and for about a thousand hectares, a, uh, uh, a grower using only conventional uh, crop protection would use a tank load, uh, truck uh, load of uh, insecticide. With our product, they use about 200 liters, which is about 1% of what you have in that truck. So the integration of semi-chemical solutions for the fall armyworm in Brazil is being done with Splat Fall Armyworm and Noctovi. And here you can see the application, the uh, attractor application of the, the uh, formulation. It's very sparse. You don't need to uh, cover the entire plant. Uh, we did, uh, I'm going to, this is a field trial where we did uh, Noctovi by itself and then Noctovi with Splat FAW for mating disruption and uh, the attract and kill for Noctovi and made in disruption at different doses. And we also use uh, uh, always the growers control method. Uh, you have to remember that these growers, they have access to all, every technology that exists for row crops in the grow, globe. So it's very, very, they are working at the maximum. They extract as much as they can from these uh, different techniques. So to go from, uh, to show differences in yield in these crops is very, very difficult. Noctovi in Brazil, in these farms is applied with motorcycles. 
and airplanes and tractors. And we use uh, monitoring traps that uh, water monitoring traps is a pheromone uh, lure to monitor populations in the field. And here you can see that in that specific trial, in red, you have the control uh, population dynamic. And then in uh, the other colors, you have the Noctovi and Noctovi and Splat at V1, V2, V3, all the way to uh, the, uh, the end of the season. We also use the David scale to trigger um, uh, applications of insecticides. So when we you hit uh, a percentage of damaged corn plants at the threshold of 20%, that triggers an application of insecticide. By uh, using uh, Noctovi and uh, Splat FAW, we have been able to reduce the number of applications in comparison with the control that took six, we were able to reduce to three applications only. But for the grower, uh, reduction of insecticide sprays is, is great, is, is excellent, but for them, they need to look at yield and profit. So instead of us uh, uh, trying to figure out what is the yield, uh, we, the grower uh, actually harvested the, the, the yield, uh, the, uh, harvested the crop, and that allowed uh, us to, are we still, um, Am I still sharing or not? Yes, you are. Okay, good. Uh, and then check what is the, uh, how much of the product we have uh, in the crop. Uh, mm -hmm. What was the, uh, what does the yield in, in the crop? And uh, the, as you can see, uh, when you compare against the control, um, we, we got basic, basically, uh, 30, uh, about 40% of larval reduction. We got 96% of trap shut down, but this is the important part where the grower got about $92 extra profit at the end of the season. Uh, we did the same thing, uh, fall armyworm uh, also attacks cotton and is extremely damaging to cotton because it goes into the flowers and the reproductive organs of the cotton uh, plant. And, um, when we do the same system to protect cotton, uh, the grower ends up with a significantly high uh, extra profit per hectare of about a thousand dollars, which is more or less uh, translates to more or less five extra bowls, five extra uh, pods of, uh, of fiber per uh, linear meter of cotton. So all the things have been shown that. Um, Semi-chemical control works in the field. Uh, we see increased um, uh, increased populations of uh, parasitoids of uh, uh, other macro um, uh, uh, microorganisms of uh, of control natural enemies, and we it, it, the the system is working for these very large growers. What about small uh, stakeholders? So we went to India together with our sister company, ATGC. And uh, in India, the biggest uh, concern that we had is that growers have very, very small plots, uh, and, but uh, the, the farms are a few acres uh, large, so like one to five hectares. Uh, they have very high uh, FAW infestation right now. And the, uh, but the interesting thing is that in corn, FAW is the main pest. And that allowed us to go after uh, products that can provide mating disruption. In India, we developed several different uh, novel formulations for, um, um, uh, for mating disruption. And we called um, them Kremit. Um, and uh, there are three here, I'm going to show three forms of Kremit. Uh, one is a, a microencapsulated system with a, a type of uh, um, organic glue that uh, uh, binds this uh, uh, microcapsules to the plant. So you end up with a very high longevity of this uh, pheromone sources in the field, even though they can be sprayed with 
um, uh, normal tractor uh, in backpack sprayers. Uh, here in this graphs, you can see the in the bars, you can see the population damage or infestation that you have with uh, a foul army worm in the field. And when you look uh, in this uh, purple line here, you see the farmer's practice. Practice. So you can see that for most of the uh, treatments that we have in, in this uh, different uh, 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 in these different graphs, you can see that the the grower uh, has the highest populations and the highest damage in the field uh, due to fall army worm. The second one is the Kermit tablet, which is a uh, we infuse the pheromone into this. Uh, nano uh, porous uh, matrices that are then uh, put together that are forming into pills. They drop at that in the field and the cremate paste, which is very similar to the formulation that we have in Brazil. But in India, instead of applying and selling this in very large containers, we have the grower um, uh, using this in small toothpaste uh, tubes. And this is the dollop that they uh, have that they put in the field. Everything is done manually. And um, the, the Kremit SM, which is the um, microencapsulated system, we found out that we can do tank mixes with that. You can use the same tank that you're going to do an insecticide application and the product works really well. Also works by itself, but it works really well with that. But, I want to bring your attention to this. In, in Brazil, when we do our trials, we use a, a minimum of 30 hectares uh, and as many as 300 hectares per plot. Here, we are using blocks of basically five acres, which is about two hectares. That's a very small plot. And we are, I was very concerned that we wouldn't be able to get good control for this plot in this plot. However, um, we went ahead, did the applications, and with the micro encapsulated uh, pheromone, we found out that it actually works. It works even better when you do tank mix with a few of the insecticides, soft insecticides that we had in India. And we can manage uh, with two applications, you can manage F uh, FAW for the entire season. And there was a reduction of 40 to 50% of the conventional insecticide applications that the grower used to control fall army worm. The, uh, those little tablets, we look at the number of tablets that we put in the field from 1,000 to 2,000 against the control or farmer's practice. Again, small, little uh, areas. Um, and again, uh, the tablets uh, work significantly better than uh, using the, the growers um, um, uh, control and the application is very simple. You just drop the pill in the middle, in the on the soil, and or into the world of the plant, and then you're done with the application. And you do you repeat that uh, in the middle of the season of V four or V five. One minute left. Sounds good. Uh, we have the cremate uh, P for FAW, where you this one we already harvested. And we have between uh, 11 to 25% of uh, uh, increase in, in control. So our conclusions are basically that biocontrol and biopesticides are extremely, um, uh, they, they work together. You, uh, they allow us to reduce the reliance on conventional pesticides. They bring more and new uh, modes of action uh, for an REM uh, program. And they can control pests that are resistant to conventional pesticides, including GM crops. And they are efficient way to control insect pests in uh, small and large areas. They are easy to execute and biopesticides and soft insecticides allow bi biological control agents to thrive. The uh, things that I would like uh, to see in a program like this is that uh, the governments in, of this region if there was a way to facilitate registration of biopesticides and biocontrol agents, I would like to see if uh, biopesticide and biocontrol agencies can be facilitated through the regulatory agencies. For example, EPA 
makes biopesticides much easier to register and takes less than a year, much less paperwork than uh, conventional pesticides. I also would like to see the governments foster the registration of other insecticides uh, with other modes of actions. We need to increase the modes of actions available for um, uh, management of pests in the region and promote safer, uh, softer pesticides in, in the field. Uh, the other part, I think uh, it was uh, really bro well brought up by Mario, is to uh, promote citizenship and this, that get the citizens to demand for safer food and safer environment, promote area-wide uh, IPM, the government promote area-wide pro uh, IPM programs, and bring these pesticides, biopesticides and biocontrol agents to the growers by fostering entrepreneurial production of these biocontrol agents in co-ops, startups, the way that they are doing in Philippines. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank Open you so much. Thank you so much. And you, you have got questions. <laughs> so, so hang in there. Um, no, great presentation. I like the um, sort of reformulation of uh, the have, attracting the pest to the solution uh, rather than the sort of pesticide to the to the pest. I uh, really like that idea. Um, you've got a few questions here and starting with the first one in attract and kill formulation to kill it, insecticide is used. Is there a fear that insects can develop resistance to this insecticide over the years? Uh, yes, um, insects are, uh, will always, um, if, if you don't control well the, uh, if you don't have a good resistance management uh, program, you are going to, uh, you are going to get a uh, resistance test. So it's very, very important that you work with an insecticide that uh, allows you to kill the insect. And be, uh, there's a big advantage to our formulations, our attract and kill formulations, that we can, um, even though we are using 1% of the amount of insecticide that the grower would use per application, we are concentrating that in very, very small uh, areas and, um, and uh, into the formulation. So uh, only the pest manipulates that. And, and in the case of Noctovi, the pest actually feeds on the formulation. So what happens is that uh, these insects are getting a mega dose of the insecticide, a uh, dose that is much above than what would be needed to kill. And uh, that delays tremendously the uh, insecticide resistance. The other thing is that you can, uh, the same way as you do with uh, GM crops where you can stack several different modes of action, you can do the same thing for this uh, attract and kill systems. You can stack one or two uh, different modes of action and you can rotate them uh, throughout the season allowing you to uh, avoid uh, the development of resistance. But that, that's a very good question. Yeah, good answer too. Um, here's a question. What actual active ingredients are in SPLAT and Noctivo? Um, so SPLAT FAW, the active ingredient is the uh, sex pheromone of uh, fall armyworm. And uh, it's a product that we produce both um, chemically uh, using uh, synthetic chemistry uh, in, in India, but also we are starting to produce that biologically, the pheromone, and reducing costs, uh, allowing us to have very, very effective formulations at a very low cost. So biological, we produce that through fermentation or through plant uh, breeding, uh, a genetically modified plant breeding that produces the pheromone itself. And okay. then for the, um, for SPLAT, we use, uh, for, for Noctovi, we use plant volatiles that are attractive to the moth but are not attracted to uh, uh, natural enemies like or pollinators like bees and uh, ladybugs. Okay, a couple. We'll just try and we've got quite a few questions, so we'll, we'll try and um, race through a few few of them. Um, here's one: the paste method seems to be labour intensive and time consuming. If you have to apply it one by one instead of just spraying it, did you compare the cost of application for the products you mentioned versus the conventional method? Yes, um, for that, that's one of the reasons why 
in Brazil, we do everything mechanically, uh, by airplane uh, especially, because of the, 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 the cost uh, of this product. So uh, you have to remember, with these products, you don't need to uh, cover the entire crop. So you can, with one pass of the airplane for Noctovi per hectare, you control the entire field. Whereas if you're using conventional pesticides, you would have to pass four times. So we are using much less material in the field, so it's easier. So even sometimes even manual application uh, can be uh, viable because the product lasts significantly longer than in, an insecticide application. In the case of uh, Splat FAW, it lasts about 45 days in the field. Okay. Uh, here's a here's an interesting question. I, I haven't seen this one before. Very interesting presentation. Thank you, said the said the the person. Could it be possible that the moth changes their sex pheromones as an adaptation to mating disruption? It's possible, and that this process is called speciation. When a moth changes its sex pheromone, uh, they have a completely different breeding system, and they become a different species so it could happen and all we need to do is to change the pheromone but it's a process that in uh in nature takes uh thousands of years uh, so we would have enough time to react <laughs> true we probably won't be around to uh to see that you and i anyway but um are, are both definitely products... not me <laughs> <laughs> Are both products, Splat and Nocti Noctovi, are they required to be used together or can we just use one of them? Uh, we can use one uh, and that was what we showed in, in India. Uh, we can use a uh, just made in disruption when the uh, key population, the key pest is the, uh, the, the, the pest that you're targeting. If you have a mix of pests, then you need to use uh, Noctovi or you need to use a mix. Okay. Okay. One last question, and then we're going to move on to our next speaker. But here's, here's a question here. Many species of parasitoids eavesdrop on the sex pheromone of their respective pest and uses these volatiles to locate the pest. How can we be sure that the... Uh, VOCs will not attract the wasps, although it does not attract ladybugs and pollinators? Um, we have um, many years of, uh, we, uh, sorry, this has been responded, uh, answered by academia, where they, they have shown that some parasitoids, uh, uh, they, they track the pheromone, but are usually in the field, we don't see that problem. Uh, we also, especially because there's uh, a, a lot of um, space between the, these areas, um, between the applications. And so you end up seeing significantly more biological control in areas where you apply pheromones than in the, in the areas that you use conventional control. Um, it's possible that uh, you might um, hit some of the, path, the, the, the species of parasitoids, but so far we haven't seen uh, and pollinators or um, bio other biocontrol agents uh, dying, uh, you know, going for this or getting disrupted by this. Okay, and one, actually one last question. Um, what if the moths fly into the field and are already mated? Will the pheromone still have an effect? The pheromone has no effect to mated females. Uh, and that's one of the biggest uh, concerns that I had in India where the, the areas were so small. So you, you have all these borders uh, where the moth can enter. So if you, um, but nevertheless, we, it was uh, really cool because we were able to see that the product actually worked there. So most of the females that are in the field, they are being originated in the field. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Excellent. No, thank you very much. And I'm just multitasking at the moment and flicking through for our last presentation. But thank you very much for that presentation. Very interesting. And there's lots of questions waiting for you there <laughs> to answer. Wonderful. <laughs> I know. It, it, very interesting. And I'm sure when you answer them, those answers will pop up for the rest of the uh, audience. So it's really important if you've got the time to, um, to have a look at that. Um, and 
I, I really like the idea of something you mentioned at the start around thinking about how farmers are also managing other pests at the same time. So ensuring that uh, you're not just thinking of one solution uh, for them, but thinking about how they may manage that as part of an integrated pest management approach. So thank you so much. Uh, really good presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Excellent. So we're now on to our last uh, speaker today, Dr. Kim Ong To, uh, and he completed his PhD uh, degree from the Michigan State University uh, in the US with a major in plant pathology and minor in sustainable farming and food systems. Uh, Kim is currently the Deputy Director of the Division of Research and Extension at the Royal University of Agriculture in Cambodia, uh, and he also works on research and extension projects related to IPM at the university. And it's a pleasure to have you join us, Kim. And I just uh, warn everyone this morning, he was frantic because he had no electricity uh, on, um, but he got the presentation here and we're really looking forward to seeing it. So welcome, Kim. Okay, uh, Alison, could you allow me to share my screen because I had some- you know, Oh, yes. On the slide. Yeah. Yep, I'm gonna stop my, okay. here we go. Sure, thank you. Okay. Uh, Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Kim from Cambodia. And uh, my uh, presentation today uh, is pretty much similar to uh, the two uh, speakers, but it's a little bit challenging to me, uh, for me to, uh, you know, like to get the presentation after the two brilliant uh, research scientists. So uh, we, uh, so here is my uh, content. So. Uh, first question, uh, I will just show briefly on the role of a uh, biological control uh, in IPM and then uh, different uh, biological control strategy uh, in combination uh, with uh, IPM. But uh, I also put some emphasis on uh, follow me warm. And then the uh, last point will be on how to promote the adoptions uh, of a biological control in IPM. Okay, so just quick uh, general uh, role of a uh, biological control uh, in IPM. I think we can go back uh, very briefly to uh, the uh, definition of APO. So we have uh, different keywords here. So it's a combine of uh, different uh, techniques that are available for pest control. And then it's also uh, need to be economically justified and then minimize risk <coughs> to human health and uh, the environment. And then uh, there are also some other points that uh, for IPM that uh, we could emphasize on the growth of uh, crops, uh, crop health, and then the keyword of uh, a grow ecosystem, and then also encourage other natural pests. So I think here it's a uh, biological control uh, would have a lot of roles to play in here in uh, uh, addressing all of these key points. And then also, it also could promote uh, population diversity as well. Uh, uh, if compared to uh, application of chemical pesticide, I think it's a lot more destructive on uh, diversity. And uh, also address with the chemical residue, especially if we apply it uh, before, uh, harvest, uh, before harvest. And then also reduce the risk of pesticide resistance. So it's the general viewpoint. Then I'm going to give some example uh, that of what we work here uh, in Cambodia. So quick example on bok choy, and then another one in on southern blight uh, in Solanaceous crop. And then I'm going to talk a lot more in uh, uh, follow me one. Okay, so here's a good example how we could incorporate uh, biological control into IPM. So uh, previously. Uh, some of my students and I conducted uh, some research uh, together uh, in the insect pest control in bok choy. So we come up with a different treatments. So I just want you to emphasize on uh, the treatment number four that we use uh, Bacillus thuringiensis and Borrelia bassiana uh, in time mixed together and apply uh, every five days. And then another one, we have uh, abamictin in early planting season, in early uh, growing stage of the crops. But in the second half, we use uh, Bacillus stringensis. And then 
uh, treatment six also we switch to a uh, region region is uh, the uh, people nail and then we also catch up with the application uh, in the second half so assuming that that we have a bok choy here uh, growing for 25 days so at the early season uh, it would be good to use chemical control in our case and then at the second half it's better that we could switch to biological control uh, because the plant is already big and then uh, if we continue apply more chemical control and then we would have some uh, chemical residue because this is a very quick crop and then usually farmer in Cambodia they just apply every three to four days of chemical uh, insecticide uh, and then some chemical insecticide they have some restriction that uh, we could not apply so when they before have wet. and then it's how the biological control come to play uh, in that because they need to continue spraying uh, because the population of the insect pest is very high so it works out not excellent but at least it helps uh, reduce the application of a, of a chemical pesticide and then another one we work on a southern blight on solanaceous crop and then uh, we can we come up with different scenario uh, and then uh, you can see some uh, uh, type of biological control for example like uh, uh, chicken chicken dung you know, trigodama chicken dung and trigodama uh, and then all of this seem does not work very well uh, to control disease and then i think the best one is chemical control as osisopin but somehow it also could uh, help protect a little bit delay disease a little bit but at the end all of this uh, treatment plan die because we use very intensive uh, inoculum in here and then later on the integrated grafting will be biological control and then it works uh, then the the efficacy improve uh, we switch the <coughs> uh, tomato and graft it on uh, eggplants and then apply biological control and then uh, you could see how uh, the plant still could survive as compared to the plants without grafting so in this case and what what uh, i want to mention here uh, if you want to promote uh, biological control alone sometimes for some disease or some insect pest it's almost impossible but if we have uh, some way how to integrate it uh, with other effective method and then it will work uh, well okay and then for fall amoeba i think uh, in cambodia we have a very recent research and fall amoeba it just it has been just uh, appear in cambodia two years ago uh, in 2019 growing season so we are very new on the experiment on this but uh, luckily, uh, my team and I had a chance to uh, visit Hyderabad and we joined the Fall and Bomb Conference before the disease outbreak. So we can collect a lot of information, uh, consensus on type of chemicals, on application from different countries, ranging from India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Thailand. And we assume that those populations would be similar because they still continue spreading. So in Thailand, and then in uh, late 2018, it's already occupied some of the province along Cambodian border. And then in 2019, uh, it just appeared on some province along uh, the Thai border in, Cambo in Cambodia. And then we conducted very quickly using information that we obtained uh, from uh, the conference, from the meeting over there. So chemicals control uh, imamictin and chlorine ternidopol. I think they are top in the consensus at that time and then we try to adapt and then modify a little bit uh, to check the efficacy and then inform our farmer uh, in Cambodia. So in 2019, we conduct uh, an experiment uh, in Batambong province close to Thai border uh, on animal feed corn. And then uh, later on in 2020, we conduct another experiment, but on sweet corn in the Mekong Delta. So these two locations is very different. Here is high, uh, a little bit uh, upland. Uh, farmer grows mainly animal feed corn, but in the Mekong Delta, uh, a lot of farmer grows sweet corn instead. So uh, we conducted uh, two different experiments. Okay, we also trap, go through the standard. Uh, uh, experiment on fall and bee bomb 
uh, using pheromone traps and then try to observe the population over time. And then as you could see here, uh, here is the picture in the for the experiment in 2020 that you can see the corn in buffer the mage almost 100% and very heavily by fall and be warm. Uh, so uh, very early in the season uh, in 2020. And then for 2019 on animal feed corn, uh, we come up with very simple uh, experiment. Uh, so we have control, apply nothing. And then we have two application of imamitin. And then the treatment number three, we have a chloron, ternilipol, alternate uh, in three application. So chloran ternilipol and then imamitin and then chloran ternilipol before the plant reach a VT stage uh, to control. Uh, and then we have uh, another option for biological control. I think it, it's a little bit not very make sense for farmer who grow animal feed because they do not find it's very useful to use uh, a lot of biological control. But for our perspective, if that's work, at least it also provide them uh, some options and also maybe could reduce the application of a, a chemical insecticide in the area. So the mating score we use standard score one to nine. I think it's very standard and it show in the manual of a uh, pollen level published already. And then uh, you can see that uh, chemical control uh, work very well. And then uh, for uh, Bastiana, uh, Bovaria Bastiana, it just uh, for animal feed corn, just not very different from uh, from a uh, chemical control, but it works well in the early season because we apply it only three times. And then uh, during the rainy season in Cambodia, a planting season, there are a lot of rains. And I think it's also play a very important role that those biological control would wash away uh, in, in there. But the two uh, treatment work well uh, on uh, animal feed corn. And here is the percentage of plant also work uh, the same thing in the same way uh, that uh, imam chloral turning the prole alternate with imamitin uh, would work best. Okay, and then here uh, we have uh, another experiment on 2020 and then uh, for me warm reach the central part of Cambodia and then we quickly uh, set up uh, the experiment. Uh, but here we increase another treatment. So we also consider the reduction uh, because uh, some farmers still not comfortable with the application uh, to, I mean, uh, uh, many, many times of a biological control because it costs a lot of money. So we want to check if the reduce, how, how it would work. Uh, okay. So as you could see here, uh, chlorantarinipril and imamitin uh, alternate application work best, and then imamitin uh, it's the second one. But Bovaria Bastiana, I think it could help a little bit, uh, not a little bit, but I think a lot in, in helping uh, the uh, reduction of uh, the damage caused by falling bomb on sweet corn. And then if you could check on this picture very quickly, as you could see here, uh, control very damaged, I think almost 100% homogeneously. Uh, uh, and then treatment number one, two application of uh, imamitin benzoate. Uh, leaves look very clean in the early season. I think we, we also have another picture, but a little bit late. And then the, the uh, plants uh, were already tall, and then you could not see a very, you know, very distinct uh, comparison here. And then treatment two, chlorantarin reprol, imamitin, uh, three application, uh, alternate. And then you could see here very clean leaves, uh, some damage, uh, but almost clean. And then compared to the buffer corn in between, you know, uh, they they have very distinct damage on there. But here, when we check the uh, application of a uh, Bovaria bassiana, as compared to control, I think there could be a lot of improvement in here. Uh, not very different in here, but if you compare to control, that's uh, a lot different. And then for sweet corn, I think it makes more sense because it has very short, 
you know, like short uh, planting date, and then uh, uh, only 75 days. And then there are also demand for fresh consumption. And then could be some uh, gaps or IPM or organic products. So biofuel control uh, also could play a very uh, important role in this case if a farmer want to grow the IPM or gap or you know or organic product for fresh consumer. It's not perfect as compared to chemical, but at least it provides significant uh, control or protection uh, as compared to the control. So here, yeah, very clear that they have the ability to kill all of me bomb in there. We also collect, uh, you know, like uh, fruits, sorry, corn here <laughs> for yield parameter, lens, you know, weight uh, per, per year, and then score on the damage on, on fruits. And then it, uh, biological control also could provide uh, some protection as compared to the control. But uh, when we uh, compare to the uh, systemic uh, insecticide, uh, it would uh, be uh, it would be less. And we also check the break test to check if the different application might have uh, effect on the flavor of the corn itself. But uh, from our experiment, we did not see any, uh, you know, uh, significant in in terms of uh, the flavor, the, the sweet sweetness, you know. So corn maybe like this and like this. I would say taste would be similar, but we just affect very much on yield and then quality also as well. Uh, the marketable yield, I think, uh, it's the the most important. And then to the last question, uh, how to promote adoption of biological control in IPM? I think it's, it uh, requires a very systematic approach. I think first of all, we need to improve biological control value chain, especially in Cambodia, not many biological control are available, currently available, and then it usually come on and off, depending on you know the value of the crops. And then we have other crops that use a lot of biological control, for example, like uh, durian, some vegetables, and some, and also black pepper. So a rear that grow a lot of those uh, plants uh, would have uh, many options. But when the price decrease, and then they also uh, are not are no longer uh, you know available uh, in the market. And then reduce cost. Biological control here is very expensive as compared to chemical control in, in terms of cost production. Promote investment, domestic production. I think most of our biological control were imported from India, some from Taiwan. I think mainly, mainly from India. And then uh, we had, uh, not, I mean, very small, very small demand. And then, you know, uh, throughout the value chain, it, it made the cost uh, very high. And re registration barrier as well. So time for registration, cost for registration, or re-registration. I think uh, we need to improve that policy to improve uh, uh, the the value chain and to reduce the cost and accessibility as well. Improve people knowledge, awareness, both farmer and you know extension worker, uh, private sector as well. Uh, product branding and price incentive. I think very difficult for corn. And I think the only option that we could uh, work uh, on corn is on sweet corn. And then until they have a good branding and price incentive, so that farmer uh, may consider using the biological control. Policy and research and uh, education, uh, it has to work align well, uh, it has to align well with the current policy of uh, research and education. And then also improve of other cross cutting issues like you know, breeding program, and other uh, technological aspect that would be uh, a cross-cutting issue because as I mentioned that depending on a biological control alone is not sufficient you need to have let's say tolerant cultivar or other physical protection for the crops and and many other 
So it's 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 the end of my uh, presentation, and then this work was supported by uh, we, we call USAID peer project, and then they collaborate with we also co collaborate with ERI. So they have the budget and we have the uh, the manpower. So we work together in conducting uh, the experiment and the research for the, the 2019 and 2020. And this year, uh, we do not have any activity anymore due to COVID, but okay. some of my colleagues already have uh, the bio called uh, the parasitoid. Uh, they imported but parasitoid and then they still raising them, but not yet, okay. not yet no, yeah, uh, released to the field. Okay, thank you. I think it's a little bit long. No, Kim, that was wonderful. Uh, excellent. And you know what, it's always uh, really valuable to hear what's actually happening uh, across ASEAN countries. And, and we haven't had this amount of detail around what's happening in Cambodia. Uh, so it's great, great to hear this. And I'm just going to tell everyone we're going to be five minutes late today because I really want to ask you some questions. Presentation was really interesting. Um, I've got a question here. Which strain of Bovaria did you use in coming from which insect? Uh, I think I cannot recall specifically on the the name the, the 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 strain. I have to check again. But it was imported from India, and it's a, a you know stain company. I think uh, those who work in camp in, in in India might okay. might know about the the name of the company from stain company. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. Um, here's another question, Dr. Kim. Do you have any data beyond week four? How about combining the chemicals with biologicals and using the chemicals earlier in the season? Uh, uh, this is the question for bok choy, right? For yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the we we, we try to come up with different scenario uh, in here because in Cambodia, insects is almost resistant. Uh, I mean, for vegetable. Uh, leafy vegetable, the insects, for example, like uh, you know, uh, diamond magmouth or uh, flea beetle, they're almost resistant to or tolerant to almost every chemical. And yeah. then farmers spray a lot of chemical, and then they come up. It would be uh, not very safe because uh, some chemical it mentioned like ten days or seven days before harvest, they could not spray the the, the chemical uh, insecticide, right? If yeah. they spray, it would cause a uh, chemical residue issue. And then, so that's why we, we try the design that provide another option that farmer could spray and provide some protection, but use uh, biological control at the end, you know, of the week, at the end of the week. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, before harvesting and then Plants is already big, and then they also more a little bit more tolerance to the damage. And like plants in the early stage, if we use biological control, uh, based on for, from our experience here, it's very challenging to use uh, biological control in early stage of the, the plantation. Okay, I've mm -hmm. got a I've got a quick question. Um, what's always an interest to the um, uh. <laughs> What's always interested many people is to know what the infestation or, or how bad is fall army worm this year? I mean, we get that question a lot. Have you seen the damage this year? Is it much different from last year? Because we hear varying reports. Sometimes it's better than last year and sometimes it's worse. What, what have you noticed in Cambodia or heard reports on? Yeah, Cambodia, I think the farmer have just started planting. And then I have been in lockdown uh, due to COVID in the city for a month already, close to a month already. My block, we are in red zone and then people are not allowed to, to go out. Hopefully, if we can get out uh, sooner, we, uh, I, I could provide the, the answer, but uh, not now. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, no, that's a, look, we COVID have, is... Uh, we will have another experiment on the using using of uh, we call conservation agriculture approach to control uh, and then let's see how they affect on fall and bomb in two different uh, locations okay uh, yeah but it has been suspend uh, delay a little bit and wait until uh, 
the government opened the city again. Excellent. Yes, no, COVID has created problems for us all. But Kim, thank you very much. And I'm just going to, I've just let, rested on this slide here because I thought you virtually gave the summary of the uh, webinar, actually. <laughs> when, when you gave your uh, sort of presentation on this slide, you virtually summarised all the sorts of things that we need to work on and look at. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. And I'd like to say thank you for your presentation and bringing it together uh, so quickly uh, and under sort of trying circumstances. Um, and I'm just going to close the webinar now because it's, it's, our, it's our last sort of workshop of this series before our very sort of integrative workshop in August. But thank you very much for your presentation, Kim. It was, it was great to hear from Cambodia and what's happening there. And I'm looking forward to seeing the results of that conservation um, biological control research as well. So okay, thank, thank you, Kim. You for having me. Yeah, thank you for thank having me. Excellent, excellent presentation. And I just want to finish very quickly. I'm going to make a very brief summary um, of today, a very rich discussion with many examples used to show the importance of biocontrol in an IPM approach to address fall armyworm and other plant pests and diseases. Mario pointed out the risks we already faced with the potential overuse of pesticides before demonstrating the important factors in encouraging uptake of biocontrol solutions, such as uh, including a participatory approach involving farmers, demonstrating the use and effectiveness and building capacity at village level. There was also a need to look at the power of what natural, console, natural control solutions that already exist in nature um, and really harness, harness that, that power such as natural predators and enemies. I really like the reframing of the problem that uh, Arjunor talked about moving from insecticide, insecticides chasing the pest approach to a pest chasing the control method, a really nice way to reframe the problem into a solution. I um, really think it was great how Kim emphasized the need for multiple tactics to be used at the same time and the ability for biocontrol to allow that happen. And important to emphasize that is that strong role for government to encourage and support biocontrol from regulatory and social perspectives. And I think um, the last point that Kim underscored, the need to improve the biological control value chain is extremely important. So a fantastic workshop and a really great way to end this series before our final integrative session late, uh, well, later in the year. I'd really like to thank all the three speakers today. I'd like to thank all you uh, people who have participated in this series as we've gone along. We've now had eight of these and many of you have actually followed the whole series as well, or at least seven uh, of, of, of the workshops, which is a great turnout. Please share your ideas and thoughts and get a community going on biocontrol. There's lots of interest there. Let's make it happen and talk further and, and keep the discussion going. Um, I would just like to say thank you to Prana for helping out in this series with the technical sort of uh, platform work. Um, and I'd like to thank all the previous speakers as well. So thank you very much for joining us and I look forward to keeping in contact. Keep safe everyone and uh, good night or goodbye or good morning. If you could answer the poll at the very end before you leave, that would be most appreciated. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>